So <clears throat> our next speaker is Adam Martin with the Center for Natural Lands Management. And Adam will be speaking about uh, the threat that fire, uh, that Scott Firm is, poses through fire and um, will tell us more about Scott Firm fuels. And um, Adam, take it away, thank you. Hey, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk today. It's going to be a little bit different than that. Uh, my colleague Nate Johnson is going to really dive into um, the the Scotch Room as a fuel and fire tomorrow. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit differently about fire and fuels, and that's because first I'm a botanist first, and then a fire practitioner second. Um, I've been working for the past 10 years or so with a, a great group of folks in the South Sound trying to restore prairie ecosystems. And fire is one of our primary tools to restore these systems. And here's the picture. You've probably seen a couple pictures of just a field of room. And, and these are habitats that used to be big open grassland systems. And they're just being converted into shrublands. Um, and so first, fire is a tool. And it's a tool to meet objectives. And fuels um, are actually complex ecological communities. And we want those fuels to have characteristics after we've been burning for a few years. Um, so for example, here is a site in the South Sound Glacial Heritage. And the image on the left is uh, the preserve in the early 90s. Um, the dark splotches are, are invaded Scots broom patches. Um, and the image on the right is from 2020. And that is after almost 30 years of restoration. And um, while we've changed the structure of, of the system back to a grassland, uh, have we actually met our objectives? Have these shrublands been restored to what we want, which is areas that are represented more by native species? Do they meet our objectives for, for species? And so um, back in 2011, I did a study as part of my undergrad. And then um, when I first came on at CNLM, um, and we were curious at this one site that has this long history of restoration. Um, are these legacy areas unique? Because as people have already talked about today, we, we know that Scott's Room leaves a legacy in the soil and that can have a long-term impact. And we we're curious if even after a decade of, of work, um, is that legacy still there? Has it changed? Um, and then we we're really curious is if there was a legacy, does that change with how much we're working in these areas? Um, so I call it a case study because it's only at one site, uh, so we don't have replicates of all of the different restoration intensities, but um, I do think it's a pretty illustrative of what we're trying to get at. And then third, um, do these legacy areas, how much do they impact um, what we want with our habitat objectives? And this goes back to fire um, because we use fire as a tool to meet our habitat objectives. And so if we're not meeting our objectives with the tools we're using, that usually means that we should stop and reassess. Um, so what I'm going to share is um, I picked out three restoration intensities that we had at the site, and it was minimal, moderate, and intensive. The minimal restoration uh, was burned once and then uh, mowed once. Uh, the moderate was burned a couple times, mowed a couple times, and consistent herbicide spraying. And then intensive was burned more than three times, um, burned yearly, um, mowed and both the moderate and then the intensive had uh, seeding done. This was back in 2011, so the, the amount of seeding we did is much less than we do now. Um, and then I stratified that by if there's a Scott's Broom legacy or not. And I did that by uh, going back to this image and tracing it in GIS and then putting random points where there was broom present and where there wasn't broom present back in the 90s. And then I had 180 quadrats and in each quadrat I recorded all the species in the cover. And so I'm going to show a couple graphs and, and we'll talk about it. So the first graph, if th this is an ordination plot, um, the axis th don't really pay attention to the axis. The way to look at this is you can sort of think of it as a map and each point represents a quadrat and all the species in that quadrat and their abundances. And points that are closer together are more related, and points that are further apart are less related. And I separate it into three different categories. The minimals on the, the right, and the intensives on the left. I don't, I don't know if it's 
reverse on your screen. Um, and the red circles are where there was never scotch from present in the 90s. And the blue circles are where there was a legacy. Um, and the big point to get here is that across all three levels of restoration, um, where there's a legacy that plant communities were different even after 10 years of, of managing Scott's Broom on the site, because um, these were measured in 2011 and we started doing work uh, around the 2000s. Um, and the other thing to notice is that you're actually seeing the opposite pattern than what you would think. And you would think that in the minimal restoration, you would have completely separated communities where the areas that hadn't been invaded um, would have more native species than the areas that were invaded. And in fact, what you're seeing is that, and in the, in the intensive, you would hope that there was no difference, that we were able to restore over the whole site. Um, so that's pretty frustrating. And then the other thing that's frustrating, here's the same plot, um, just color coded by uh, the restoration intensity, is on the left where there is no legacy, we sort of see what we'd expect and what we want. And is that as we're doing more and more work, we're, we're changing the communities more and more. Um, but where there was a legacy, what we're seeing is that we're not really seeing any change in the community. And Looking in the data more, I looked at sort of three variables that could be structuring the communities, and the first one's nativity. Uh, and so this is just the proportion of native cover relative to all of the cover in plot. So, so of all the plant species there, um, how much of it's represented by native plants? And you see the blue where there was a legacy across all the treatments that we did, there wasn't really a, a change in the in the cover of nativity nativity and the the bars are confidence intervals 95 percent confidence confidence intervals and then where there wasn't a legacy you can see exactly what we wanted is that as we're treating more we're increasing nativity as we're getting rid of non-native species and seeding a new species the other thing we do a lot of burning for is for butterfly habitats for rare butterflies and one thing we know about that is that exotic grasses typically really degrade quality butterfly habitat. And so here, the y-axis is the cover exotic, exotic grasses within a quadrat. Um, and then the x-axis is the three treatment we did. And then um, the colors are the legacy. And here, which is also really frustrating, is you can see where there was a legacy, we had, we, there was no effect of fire or herbicide or mowing uh, on exotic grass cover. And where there wasn't a legacy, we saw pretty much what we wanted, where once we started doing some moderate to intensive work, um, we were able to knock down uh, the exotic grass cover. Um, and then lastly, one of the, I do a lot of work with golden paintbrush, uh, which is a rare hemi, hemi parasite that likes really diverse communities. Um, and so the, y-axis is basically a, a measure of the plant community status or how, how many uh, host species, how many different species there are um, relative to the number of species that are, uh, what's a good word, um, inhibit that quality. And basically it's just, a, it's a index between zero and one. And basically as it increases, the habitat quality increases. Um, and so, again, as we see, is when there's a legacy, uh, we're not making golden pamperish habitat better. It's not changing at all. While when there is no legacy, management is increasing habitat quality is what we want. And so, frustratingly, legacy communities are really persistent. Um, I would like to go back, because we've, you know, we keep doing work there, so it's been another 10 years already. And I'd like to go back to these plots and see if um, we've gotten any better because I hope the past decade we've really improved our techniques and uh, the amount of seed we can put on the ground and, and how and we've really changed a lot of our practices so I'm curious if um, maybe it's not as bad nowadays. Um, the second point is and, and this sort of makes sense when you think about it um, is more intensive disturbance amplifies these differences and it's because fire kills plants you know it kills native and non-native plants um, so does mowing and, and herbicide. It, it's a lot of stuff happening to these communities that are already pretty degraded and 
Um, a lot of native species on, on the prairies can have pretty limited distributions um, and maybe not really huge population sizes. Um, and so it would make sense the more that we're burning and the more that we're, we're mucking up the system, uh, the, the greater likelihood that we're probably amplifying some of these legacy conditions. Um, and then the third point is that uh, in terms of restoration, uh, these legacy communities are less suitable for endangered species. And I, I think for me that highlights, we really wanna get on these invasions, especially in prairie ecosystems pretty quickly um, before they, they, they push these systems too differently in a direction we don't wanna go. Um, and the other thing is, so we did look at some soil conditions um, in these plots. We didn't find a really strong difference in nitrogen uh, levels between the legacy areas and the other legacy areas. We did some microbial work, um, but we haven't finished analyzing that data. Um, so we definitely need some better understanding of the soil conditions. Um, and what might be most challenging, and, and as probably a lot of you know, is restoration is just hard. Um, it's hard to to put these ecosystems back together um, when they're really degraded, is that this could just be a regime change and these could just be sort of no novel habitats that are, are gonna be persistent. And uh, I think the last thing, also thinking about next step forwards is, um, so this is Western Buttercup. And, and one thing that could be happening, and, and this is sort of alluded to in the Douglas Fir talk, is that these soils could just be changing how plants can persist uh, in the ecosystem and these legacy effects on the soils could just make them unsuitable. So Western buttercup's a, a really common prairie species. It's an important butterfly nectar plant. Um, and this is a graph on the bottom. Um, you have the no is no legacy, the yes is there's a legacy. The bottom is the flowering stock length, so, so how high up the flowering stock is from the ground. And the top is the, the number of flower buds uh, which are the gray, and then the number of flowering stems, which are the black. And on legacy soils, um, the overall reproductive fitness of Western buttercup is lower. And so if we're thinking about why these plant, why these communities could be different through time, it could just be um, the ability for plants to persist through time is, is lower because they're not able to be as reproductively fit, fit especially compared to non-native species. And so I think that's the next direction is doing some of these individual species through time. And that's what I got. <laughs>